thank you again uh, all for um, uh, being here on um, lunchtime. And uh, um, yeah, it's my pleasure to have uh, Sherak here. Uh, this is uh, you're the very first people I think publicly to actually see this work. Uh, yeah. has been just in the making in the past two weeks. Uh, it's very exciting work that leverages Cori GPU and uh, Mesh TensorFlow, which is a model parallelism framework. Um, I'm going to actually read Chirag's bio because I made the mistake of saying a lot of nonsense when I introduced the last time. So Chirag okay. so, Modi is a final year physics uh, graduate student uh, here at UC Berkeley. Um, as he works with uh, uh, Urosh Seljak here, and his interests lie in developing novel combinations of forward modeling frameworks and machine learning methods. And that's what we're going to hear about today uh, to maximize the information gained from cosmological surveys and answer fundamental questions about the birth and evolution of our universe. Uh, thank you, Sharad, for being here on such a short notice. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to talk about FlowPM. This is the particle mesh simulation that we are developing in TensorFlow. This is the work being primarily done by me, Francois, and Uroj for now. And then we are actively seeking collaborators for this right now. Uh, so the talk is essentially split into two, roughly. Uh, in the first half of the talk, I'll try to motivate why we need these kind of simulations. So that will be like some basic cosmology. I'll try to keep the jargon to minimum. But uh, so that's the scientific part. And then the next half of the talk will be how we have developed these and at what stage we are at right now and what we need in the future for this. Okay. So uh, let's start with the big picture. This is the Lambda GDM view of the universe. So in cosmology, what we want to do is essentially try to study the birth and evolution of the universe. We know the big picture in principle that there was a big bang, which basically gave rise to the universe followed by an inflation where the universe expanded. And uh, that after that, uh, essentially, the, in the expanding universe, the dark matter collapsed to form halos and galaxies that we observe today. So based on these things, uh, what we want to do is essentially constrain the evolution of the universe. In Lambda CDM universe, that is governed by these six parameters. For example, things like how much dark matter there is, how much baryons there are. Uh, what's the age of the universe, things like that. This is the simplest model. Then you have extended model, which bring in dark energy and other, uh, other scientific questions uh, that we have. So how we approach this in cosmology is basically through different kind of cosmological probes. First of them is the cosmic micro background radiation. This is essentially the first light of the universe, which was generated at the very beginning of the universe from there. Uh, so this is the furthest that you can see uh, in the universe. Other than that, we have other surveys. So you have like galaxy clustering surveys. These are big telescopes that are essentially mapping out the universe to see where how the galaxies are clustered together. Second, we have uh, supernovas, which are basically stars going boom. So these are explosions, which outshine the entire galaxies for short periods of time. And they allow us to see in the local regions to the furthest reaches of the universe and allow us to constrain the expansion of the universe. Next, we have gravitational lensing. Uh, this is essentially bending of the light due to the dark matter as it comes from the distance galaxies to us. And with this bending of the light, this is one of the only probes that you can essentially probe the dark matter directly. For other else, for everything else, you essentially rely on the photons, but here uh, on the visible matter, but this gives you a constraint on the dark matter directly. So where we are going with this is essentially we have a uh, these are some of the next generation surveys that are coming online within a year or two. One of them is the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument or DESI. This is close to the home. This is led by people up at Building 50. And the data for this is going to be hosted at NOSC itself. Uh, so this is a 14,000 square degree surveys over five years. 14,000 degrees is essentially, square degrees is essentially one third of the total sky that it will be mapping out. And it achieved first light uh, last month, I think. So this is the first picture of the sky that it took and the first spectrum of this. Right, so in five years, it will map 35 million galaxies. To compare the previous largest spectroscopic survey that we had, BOSS, which concluded a couple years back, traced out 1.5 million galaxies in comparison. So this is huge. Uh, in just one year, it will collect more data than that survey ever did. 
And from this, we'll basically want to study the growth of structures and dark energy in the universe. So just to show how good the constraining power of this survey is going to be, this is a W a parameter diagram for constraining dark energy. These are little parameters that constrain dark energy. The blue curve here is the best constraints we have from the previous survey. The red curve is what we'll get from DESI at the end of five years. Uh, the point at the center, like one comma zero point, minus one comma zero point is, for the lack of better word, not interesting science, but everything other than that. If we have constraints other than that, then it's a new science that we do not know yet. Next, we have uh, LSST, which is the Large Synapse uh, Survey Telescope. This is going to be the largest survey that we have ever done. It's going to get 1,000 images each night, which will generate 15 terabytes of data for 10 years. 15 terabytes per night for 10 years. Uh, 18,000 square degrees, and it will observe the entire sky once every few days, which will essentially give you 10 billions of objects, each observed 1,000 times. So the point I'm trying to make here that the precision for this is going to be huge. Uh, and given that this will generate so much data, you can do all kinds of science from galaxy clustering, weak lensing, supernova that I just mentioned, and many other things. Uh, this is again the same dark energy constraints. Uh, red is the curve, red is the constraint that we have here, and the black is what is the potential of these surveys to give us in the future. Right. So the modern cosmological surveys will have unprecedented statistical power, that goes without saying, and we have great potential for new discoveries. So data is no longer a problem there, like we have enough data at this point, we'll get enough data at this point. The problem is how to best use it. And that brings in a lot of challenges. So just to briefly outline some of the challenges that we'll be facing is we have different cosmological probes that will be tracing the universe. And you want to combine them together because you break degeneracies, you become robust against systematics and stuff. Uh, so you want to combine them together. But since they are tracing the same universe, they are correlated to each other. And that brings a problem. So you have to come, when you're doing inference, you want to calculate the joint covariance, which basically takes all the, para all the probes together into account. And that's a huge problem. So that's what I'm showing here. This is a sample covariance matrix for five different observables which are broken up by these solid black lines. And you see that there are huge octagonal components. The way you mostly get covariance matrices and cosmology is by running simulations. But here now you have a few challenges because you want to get precise simulations which generate all those five observables at the same time uh, with enough precision. <coughs> so uh, the next question that you have is like, what are the optimal summary statistics that you want to use to get the information from this data. Uh, so this is showing a slice of an n-body simulation at, uh, today, at the present time. And if you look at this field, this field is anything but a Gaussian field. And the most, uh, the favorite statistic that cosmologists use is two-point function or the power spectrum of any field, which is an optimal summary statistic if you have a Gaussian field, but this is anything but that. So you can go to higher order functions, you can go to three-point functions, you can go to peak counts and other kind of things. But again, uh, you do not know which of them is optimal. And secondly, how do you combine all of them? Because again, they are getting some of the information is common to all of them. And then the third problem is, how do you do the analysis once you have this? So the most the common way you do it is like, once you have the summary statistic of your choice, you write down an analytic likelihood for that. And then you run an MCMC chain to get the posterior on the parameters that you're interested in. So this is, I'm showing an example of posterior. Uh, but this severely constrains you because now you have now you are focused on writing down an analytics with, and which is the constraint, which essentially constrains all the inference that you can you're going to make out of this. So the point of this slide is essentially to say we have enough data, we have enough statistical power, but we need to come up with analysis techniques to be able to make the best use of that data. Maybe a quick question. Yep. Um, if you have a deep learning power simulation, uh, you will need to compare the result of that simulation to what you observe. Yeah. So this, the second question on what is the optimal summary statistic, you need to solve that. Uh, uh, so to make that comparison. Right, so uh, I mean, I was not going to go much further on that, mm -hmm. but uh, there, so there are multiple inference. Uh, one of the inference things that we can do is you can use the reconstruction, which I'll go uh, in detail 
slight detail later on, reconstruct the initial conditions of the universe. And if you look at the previous figure uh, with the CMB, that was highly Gaussian. So if you reconstruct that field, then you know that the power spectrum is the summary statistic for that one. And so this is one of the ways that we are trying to explore is if we can reconstruct the initial conditions of the universe and get parameters from there because there you know the optimal summary statistic. So if, uh, so, so that's, you know, if, if you want to use the, the initial condition as the yeah. one optimized, but how about the, uh, the evolution of the universe or the universe as it exists right now? Yes. I guess I'll give you some research that, that you uh, want to compare it to a deep learning part simulation, or maybe that's not uh, So, I mean, uh, right now people use to depend on the observable of interest. We have different summary statistics, and people are trying to combine them. Uh, I will talk briefly about like using uh, deep learning models to learn that likelihood and compare them. Uh, but I was not I was trying to keep the cosmology to minimal yeah, for this. Uh, but yeah, we can. There are works going doing that. Okay, so one way to do that is to build a forward modeling approach. Uh, here, what you do is that instead of putting all your eggs in one basket and trying to get the analytic likelihood, you take a step back and then you try to forward model the entire observations that you have. The advantages of this is that you can combine different uh, cosmological probes together. Uh, and you can also break your forward model into different components, each of which is like uh, each of which is tractable. So what I'm showing here is an example to is an example for probab probabilistic hierarchy model to get the galaxy shear. Here, these are the cosmological parameters, and this is the n-body simulation that you do to get the get the observables. And these are different kind of systematics and other noise models that go into your pipeline. Uh, you can parameterize all of them with latent parameters, but the problem here becomes is that then the number of parameters increases. Like uh, you have a high dimensional problem for inference. This has been a challenge for a long time, but recently a lot of uh, methods have been proposed which can be indestructible. The common thing for all of them is that you need fast, accurate, differentiable for simulations. So this is one step where you can use them. Uh, the next thing where they can be useful, this is just, so this is essentially one of the examples from the previous slide, uh, but this is important for us because we have spent a lot of time over the last three years thinking about this at BCCP down in the hill. Here, what we want to do is essentially, if you have a forward model to go from the initial conditions to any of the observed data, you want to reconstruct, you want to use that to reconstruct some kind of latent cosmological fields, which you do not see and use them for analysis. So one example would be to reconstruct the initial conditions, as I just mentioned, and use that for optimal summary statistic. But you can do other things. You can use this to denoise the data if you have it. You can generate velocity field and other kind of fields which you do not see, but which inform other kind of analysis that you have. Uh, in the simplest way, you would, how would you approach it is you would write a posterior for the initial conditions. <coughs> I'm starting from initial conditions because I know they are Gaussian, so I know the exact pattern on them. And you'll write the likelihood, which is basically data, <coughs> compare the data against the forward model simulation. The challenges here are this is a high dimensional optimization problem. If you want to do it over the whole space, you're dealing with 10 to the power eight parameters in the initial conditions at the very least. And if you want to have realistic chances of maximizing that posterior, you need to use gradient based algorithm, which brings you back to differentiable forward models. Uh, the second problem here is you do not know the correct likelihood for the noise model for the observed data. Here I've used Gaussian just as an example, but this may not be the case. Uh, so that's where you can use deep learning as I'll show you later. Uh, for now, we have been working on this for like last few years. We have developed uh, an entire framework for this, uh, entire framework for this at BCCP. Uh, so we came up with our own order def library. Uh, this was mostly done by Yufang with, uh, with other people. And over the last three years, we have applied it to different cosmological probes. So we have applied it to dark matter, galaxies, peak lensing, 21 centimeter intensity mapping, lamin alpha for different end goals for different cosmological probes. The point I'm trying to make here is that this is uh, very useful, but and we have the framework for this, but to go beyond what we have right now, we need interfacing with deep learning. So, okay. So I think at this point, uh, we have 
reached a point where I've convinced you hopefully that we need cosmological forward models which are differentiable. So taking a step back, what are cosmological forward models? So what happens, what you do in cosmology is you start with initial conditions of the universe and then you try to evolve the particles under gravitational force. This is a slice from the list, a movie from the illustrious simulation. On the left, I'm showing the dark matter, which we kind of understand because it only interacts with gravity and no gravitational force. So that simulation you can do. On the right, what I'm showing is how the baryons or the visible matter, it traces, uh, evolves uh, over the universe. So it traces the underlying dark matter well, as you can see, it's sort of like wherever you have a peak there, you have a peak here. But getting this to work correctly is super expensive because you have to take into account all the hydrodynamics and uh, all the other forces that go in along with the gravity. And these are super expensive simulations, so you cannot run them over and over again multiple times. So what we do in cosmology is the next best thing. Uh, the forward models in cosmology, again, you start with the linear field. Uh, so this is the linear dark matter field here. I have not put in any variance at this point. You will do the n-body simulation to get the final dark matter field. And after this, depending on the observable of interest, your forward models can diverge. Uh, most often what you do is you find dark matter halos. These are the high density regions in the dark matter field, which have collapsed under gravity, because that's where we think mostly the galaxies form. And to put in galaxies, what you do is uh, use some kind of distribution model, Poisson sampling and things like that based on physics, informed physics to generate galaxies there. Okay, uh, now the whole point was to come up with differentiable forward models. This step, as I'll show later, and body simulations can be made differentiable, but these group finding algorithms and the distribution approaches are not differentiable. So that's the first step where uh, deep learning can help is that you can develop hybrid differentiable forward models here. So what I'm showing here again is the initial conditions, the final dark matter field and the halos or galaxies in this case that you have sampled. And we train a neural network to go from the final matter field to the density. So this is just my <coughs> With this kind of hybrid differentiable forward model, you can go back and the, way, the place where we use this was to reconstruct the initial conditions of the universe. So if you start with some random guess for the initial conditions, uh, you see that there is, no, uh, there is no correlation between the two. You write down the posterior that you have and then you optimize it and you reconstruct basically uh, this kind of thing. So you have reconstructed the data and the final dark matter field exactly, not exactly, but more or less uh, exactly. You have reconstructed initial fields correctly on the large scales, on the small scales, which are dominated by noise. You do not reconstruct everything back, and so things look washed out. The problem, uh, so while this works, what I used here was a Gaussian likelihood, and to make it a Gaussian likelihood, I had to smooth my data on large scales, which is losing a lot of information. So uh, what you want to do next is essentially go a step further and want to learn the likelihood. So for example, you can try to use deep learning to learn the likelihood of, given a dark matter field, what is the likelihood of a galaxy field that I see? And while I'm phrasing it in terms of galaxies, you can do this with any observable that you're interested in. So one way you can do it is use a mixture density network. What it does is it really takes in an input. So what you do here is you parameterize your uh, likelihood for the data with a mixture model. Uh, say for example, a Gaussian mixture. And then you're trying to learn the parameters of that likelihood model given an input vector field. Uh, right, and the loss function that you optimize is essentially the likelihood of the data. So once you have this, you can use this back for the, in our case, for the reconstruction <coughs> exercise. You can go a step further, you can use pixel CNN. Uh, what this allows, what a pixel CNN does is basically write down the likelihood of the data as an autoregressive model. So, for example, the probability of having an observation at XI depends on all the points in the data that you've seen before. What this does is allows you to capture correlations in your noise and data. So you do not have to stick to the diagonal likelihood that we have been using for so far. Uh, so we have this working. Uh, this is just showing a mixture density network that I trained to learn the galaxy positions. So on the left is the galaxies that are find with our traditional cosmological model. The right is a sample that I generated from the likelihood learned with the mixture density model. Uh, so that step we have uh, under control. So 
right? Uh, okay. So this entire setup was to convince you to answer this question with a yes. Do we need differentiable forward and body simulations that allow interfacing with deep learning model? And if you answer that question with yes, what we have is LoPM, which is differentiable fast models and and body simulations in TensorFlow. All right. Uh, so that was the cosmology part of it. Now uh, I'll basically discuss what we have done so far and where we want to go next. So uh, taking a step back, uh, n-body simulations are hard and expensive. The way you approach them in cosmology is with the next best thing what you have is a particle mass simulation. In particle mass simulation, what you do is you put particles on a grid and calculate gravitational forces on a regular grid. You lose uh, small scales based on the grid resolution in this case, but at, uh, on the large scales, things still are correct. And so the numerical scheme for this is essentially the steps that you take is you interpolate particles on the grid to estimate the mass density on the grid. Uh, the interpolation scheme that people mostly use is the cloud and cell binning. So what I'm doing here is this particle, I've split it into like four. It's uh, giving weight to the four nearest grid points so in 2D, 8, and 3D. Uh, once you have the mass on a regular grid, uh, you can use fast Fourier transforms to calculate gravitational forces. So this is just the Poisson equation, which is relating gravitational potential to the mass density. And you take the Fourier transform uh, to get the force at that point. For the cosmologists in the room, I'm taking some liberties here, but uh, that's besides the point. Uh, Next, once you have the forces, you interpolate them back to the grid points. Uh, sorry, once you have the forces on the grid points, you interpolate them back to the particle positions. And then you update the momentum of the particle. So this is just updating the momentum with the force and a time stepping function. So the K kappa here is a scalar. And once you have updated the momentum, you can update the positions of the particles. So this is one time step in a particle mesh simulation, and then you just repeat it for however many times you want. So the whole point of this is that PM simulations is a series of kick drip kick operators. And the only two critical operations you need are fast Fourier transforms and interpolations. Fast Fourier transforms are what basically gain you a lot about the n-body simulations in this case. But when you are doing uh, parallel processing, that's also what we'll see that will slow us down later. Uh, Right. Uh, regarding for the communication, most of these steps, except for the FFT, just require communication between neighboring ranks. FFT will require communications throughout the volume. Yeah. Okay. So we have this working. Uh, this is low PM simulations. Uh, this is actually running live in the background, thanks to transfer. Uh, what we have, so let me run you through this code. So this is doing the entire PM simulation that we have. All you need to do is define the stages, which is the time steps that you want to take. Uh, you generate the initial condition, the Gaussian initial conditions that you are interested in. Once you have the Gaussian initial condition, you calculate the first displacement and the velocities from the theoretical inputs that you have, like from cosmology, cosmological models. Once you have the initial displacement, this thing is just doing the embodied dis the whole PM simulation. Uh, so the kick drift series of kick drift drift. And once you have the final positions of the particles, you just interpolate them back and integrate to get your final feed. So this is the entire code that you have to do for n-body simulations. And because it's written in TensorFlow, I had to press it again, sorry. Okay. Because it's written in TensorFlow, what you can do is essentially use it for reconstruction and do the whole thing in like essentially 10 lines. Uh, so the difference here from the previous code is that I've made my linear input field a variable, which is trainable. And then this is just doing the same n-body simulation to get the final field. Depending on your likelihood, you just write down the residual and the likelihood that you have. And you write down the prior that you have, and that's your loss function, and you just optimize it to reconstruct the initial conditions. This is super cool because this takes us two years to develop in the other framework, which is in 10 lines here. Uh, Again, because it's in TensorFlow, you can interface it with the deep learning elements. So if you have a mixture density network or a pixel CNN kind of model to learn your likelihood of the data, all you have to do is remove these two lines and I'll comment this line, which will essentially replace your likelihood for any observed data that you want with this. Uh, 
Right. Uh, so this motivates that you have essentially split your problem into two. In first case, you are taking the physics with the flow PM into account. So you are evolving dark matter exactly as you know how you should be. And the deep learning thing can be used to learn the likelihood or other observables which you do not know. Yeah. So <laughs> because you're doing this in, in TensorFlow, what, what if any, are your limitations on resolution and size of the box you get to use and that sort of thing compared to a kind of a modern? That's what I'm coming to next. So that, that's the next five seconds of the talk, essentially. Uh, yeah. So maybe a more conceptual question I should have asked two slides ago. Does differentiability ensure uniqueness of solution? Uh, no. So uh, if you think about it, like uh, most of these, so this will give you the map reconstruction of the uh, thing you're interested in. <coughs> there are reasons to believe that uh, at some point you do not have a unique solution. So that's what uh, we did a, a like version you find had a paper on that, like depending on the noise level and the initial resolution, you do not have a unique solution. The simplest way you can think of it is that if you have two particles which have after shell crossing, you do not know if they like did a crossing or they came from, I don't have a diagram for it, or if they came from uh, individual point. So on small scales, you definitely do not have a uniqueness of the solution. Uh, the point is you want to quantify, if it's not unique, you want to quantify the region. So that basically goes to the uncertainty estimates that you want to do. So whatever inference scheme you come up with to get the constraints on the cosmological parameters, you need to take that into account. I mean, there is additional uncertainty introduced by the neural network, right? So, oh, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. So, I guess is that taken into account? Uh, so far, we have not that taken into account in this. Yeah. So, this is the loss function. Uh, uh, so, so, that's the loss function is increased. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. So, uh, uh, some of that gets taken into account, but you're not, in a way, monetizing over that. Uh, Right, so this is essentially answering your question. Uh, okay, so the practical challenges are that simulations of interesting size do not fit on the GPU. Everything that I've shown you so far that we have been working with, like that we have had for like last uh, couple of months at this point, and we'll be using that on a single GPU. So the whole reconstruction framework with a 128 cube simulation, which fits on one GPU, I'm using whole down here on us. Uh, so that is operational. But any survey of uh, interesting size will not fit. And like it's, you have to go at least to 1,000 Q, uh, depending on the observation. Like for some observations, like 21 centimeter intensity mapping, we had to go to 10,000 Q simulations. Uh, and depending on like uh, it's a high dimensional optimization. So depending on the optimization scheme that you want to use, if you're using something like the current inference machine, uh, you will need batches of this 1,000 Q simulations. So Essentially, the point being volumes scale, like this number scales up super quickly. Yeah. Just a quick question. So, on the memory usage, do you know like what, how much memory the mesh takes versus the protocols? Uh, and, then, and then all the framework that keeps track of the derivative throughout the simulation, how much yes. is that actually dominating the memory? Uh, that's a good question. So, at least uh, for, I do not know about <coughs> yet because I haven't done profilings for that here yet. But uh, in the previous framework that we developed with you, Frank, uh, in like Python framework there, there uh, I think it was the gradients were equally expensive as like one forward simulation, uh, both in memory and computation. Uh, it kind of also depends. Hmm? You also have mesh versus particles, right? Uh, what, what do you mean by mesh? Oh, the force mesh here is equal to one. So that's the same cost. Yeah, as the yeah. Yeah. So same. one particle per cell. Yes. Uh, so, so, the same. Yeah. Like in the other Python framework, we had the option of like going to higher resolution for the mesh. So we had be able to do that. Uh, so that will just scale it up like not exactly eight times, but somewhere close. Uh, uh, I think it also depends actually for the on the implementation and on the observables because I know for some observations you need the full light cone and so you need to snap, save every snapshot for calculating the gradients bar. So that scale up. So it depends on what your observable of interest is. Okay, uh, so we need distributed framework for machine learning and this has been achieved by data filism. So they have reached exascale uh, computing for this uh, in which you mostly split the uh, batches across uh, different ranks. 
But what we need is a model parallelism, like where we are essentially splitting our whole mesh and the, if it think about it in terms of deep learning, you have to spread your weights and tensors across all the lines. And so we have started working on this with my friends of Lovatik and on Google DPUs. So, uh, the choice of TPUs being motivated by availability given to them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, firstly, like uh, when we were working on the 128 cube thing, we thought we can switch to TPUs because they have bigger memory. Uh, but then we found out, like, obviously, that was not sufficient enough, even a single TPU, even there we have to parallel. So, that's when we. <coughs> Okay, so a uh, few quick words on mesh TensorFlow. The mesh here stands for an n-dimensional array of the processes that you have, which are connected by the network. Uh, and what this mesh TensorFlow thing does is gives you a uh, API so that you can still write the logical program in TensorFlow while uh, it takes care of abstract uh, putting it on the processes across it. So the way you each tensor is distributed in across all the meshes, and it's done essentially in three steps. First, you describe a uh, mesh layout. So this is essentially how many dimensions does your mesh have and you name each of those dimensions. Uh, next, you identify the tensor dimensions. So the dimensions that you want to split in different tensors and you name them. All the dimensions that you do not name are going to be essentially replicated on all the meshes. And then you identify a computation layout, which is essentially a mapping from tensor dimension to the map mesh dimension. So which tensor dimension has to be split across which ranks and everything. Uh, so this is a super simple example to illustrate this. This is a, a simple two layer fully connected network. So all you are doing is X times W, which gives you the hidden layer and then the hidden layer times gives you the output Y. Uh, so in the first lines here, you are defining the dimensions that you want to display. Uh, you're naming all the dimensions. In the second uh, part of this, you are getting the tensors with the dimensions that you decided. And then the last part is just the logical operation that you would do to write down this fully connected network. So if you are, if you say you have two processes and you are splitting your batch across those two processes, so that's what the layout rule is specifying there. And what that will look like is something like this. So you have the batches you have split into two, while these zero and one are the two processes you have. So these are split into two, while these two arrays get, will get replicated on both the processes. Uh, if you go to split the model, in this case, you have decided to split the hidden layer that you have. So in this case, the X and Y are replicated on both the nodes and everything else gets split across uh, the process. And then you can scale it up, you can combine the two things. So now you have a 2D mesh uh, in which you have decided to split the batch across the rows and hidden cells across the columns. So that gives you a splitting like this. Okay, uh, so we have Technically, uh, it is working. This is a simulation, 128 cube simulation that we ran on, uh, I think, two Cori GPU nodes with uh, eight uh, GPUs each, and on DPU, uh, as we thought we do. Uh, so this is 128 cube simulation with, I think, 10-step PM simulation uh, that we used this. Uh, right. So it's, it's working, but uh, now comes the questions that we are here for mostly. Uh, so the things, uh, the thing, the bottleneck for this is going to be FFTs. So uh, this is a slice from a citation, but this is a figure from one of the papers. Uh, we ran a hidden valley simulation on us, which was the first 10,000 cube simulation that we ran on us. So this is C, this is not TensorFlow. Uh, what I'm trying to show here is basically that if you look at it, 50% of the time, more than 50% of the time in both U56 cube simulation and a 10,000 cube simulation, sorry, 2,000 cube simulation and a 10,000 cube simulation gets taken up by FFTs. So these are going to be the bottleneck uh, for our computation. And just by itself, optimizing FFTs is a good thing because they are also used for other science goals. Like any kind of signal processing you do, you want to do MRIs or anything, uh, they all require FFTs. So if you want to go for model parallelism on uh, multi-scaling using any of these, uh, this is a good choice to begin with. So we started investigating this. This is our <coughs> first super naive implementation of FFT, which works. All we are doing here is essentially combining FFT along the three dimensions. Uh, so you 
where you do one FFT along every dimension once, and then you reshape and split the arrays, and then do the dimension FFT along the next dimension, and so on and so forth. Uh, you need to do this transpose and reshape operation because the direction that you are doing the FFT in has to be on the same processor. And since you have split them, uh, only one of the dimensions can be like on one processor at a time. Uh, <clears throat> I'm certain that we can do better than this uh, in terms of algorithm. But uh, one thing you can also do is like implement the transpose and reshape as like a single mesh operation by being somewhat clever, which we have yet to be. Uh, but the whole point is that this is a very different communication from the general deep learning cases because here you are essentially communicating communicating the full tensor across all the ranks at every step, twice, but every step, as it should be. So for this reshape thing, you're actually kind of like um, moving the data around, yeah. like at every, for yeah. every axis, you have to do a complete like transformation of where exactly. all the data is. <laughs> exactly, so you have to basically, yeah, pick up all the data from the just split and then uh, put it on the same okay. rank, and then you have to put the other data. And then you just split up the rest of the dimensions as much as needed so that it can actually fit. Uh, so this is uh, the benchmarking we did on GPUs, on Cody GPUs. So this is with, uh, I think, one TensorFlow server per node, and we had like eight nodes on that, uh, eight GPUs on that node. The mesh that I'm using is a simple 1D mesh, and I'm just splitting my X dimension across all those eight processes. Uh, I think on Cody GPU, they use the device placement mesh implementation for the and default GPRC communication. Uh, and though I'm not showing here, when you go from one node to two node, things fall down by like factor of 10 the performance. So this is just showing the communication and word. So essentially everyone is talking to everyone because of those operations. And this is essentially the time that is spent in execution. So all the colored things is some execution going on, white thing is basically nothing is happening. Uh, so it's bad, numerically it's 16 milliseconds of execution and 160 milliseconds of the full compute time that it takes. Uh, as compared to, this is what, the same operation done on a single GPU, uh, which is like nice and full all along. Uh, so we have the script and the issues open for this on the mesh uh, on the GitHub here, uh, which is public, so anyone can look and contribute to this. Uh, similar thing on the TPU, uh, same one generator mesh with 32 cores split along the x-axis. Uh, so on the left, essentially you see that 56% of the time has gone into communication out of which 50 is wasted. The second line shows that 18% time went into FFT and almost all of it was wasted, which kind of tells that our implementation is not the best in the world, <coughs> which we agree, but still like even with the vanilla implementation, that seems like an awful lot of time, which is wasted for FFTs here. So do the GPUs just have ethernet? On... No, it's infinite band. It's infinite band. Probably not that it really matters, but yeah. Uh, and so this is showing how the different chunks are the same thing. Uh, the thing that we can optimize over here is essentially between two FFTs, we have two or dual communications, which is essentially the transpose and the reshape thing. So this is again pointing out that if we combine them together, then that should save us like half the time here. Uh, so that's from the computational part, like uh, algorithm be part of it, but uh, the rest of the point still stands here. Uh, so you wanted to uh, you wanted to combine the transpose and reshape, so it just reduces the amount of data movement, right? Yes, but yes. you're still shifting so things around so that you have a whole dimension yeah. on one. Can you not break that? Can you somehow do FFT that works across devices? Uh, I think. Uh, I mean, no. No. <laughs> I mean, so typically, no, no is the usual answer. Uh, one, one important point also to make here is that we have different implementation of how this mesh is, is being uh, run on TPUs and GPU. Here we're using this um, SIMD mesh implementation, which is essentially doing something similar to an MPI communication. So uh, between different uh, nodes or different devices. But in the first implementation, we're using uh, something slightly different where we have individual graphs being executed by different uh, devices, but all is managed by a single process. So it's not as scalable, uh, the implementation that we're using on Core GPU. So that's, that's why we're interested in, in playing with TPUs, is that because we have these, these efficient and scalable uh, pilot operations. Basically, the second point uh, that we're going to make here. Uh, 
yeah, so this is uh, things that we have in mind to like push forward with more extensive on us. Uh, the first thing is optimized GPU communications. So right now we are using the default tensor probe communication, uh, but maybe we can gain a bit uh, from like using the MPI and create communications which are specific to the hardware. Second is the mesh implementation that Francois just said. Uh, if the device placement implementation is actually scalable for like exascale computing on query. Uh, and third is just uh, that uh, the TensorFlow does not have uh, the input output, the distributed input output, which you need to save large scale communications. Um, but so just one point. So, so, so at this stage, uh, the normal way to, to extract something out of the computational graph is to turn your distributed tensor into a tensor that is fully replicated across all devices. So it needs to be small enough and then you can extract it into a normal TensorFlow. Um, so that's fine if you're looking at some summary statistics of your data, and for us it might be enough. But if you want to save your simulation output, you need to have also distributed um, output of those tensors. Okay. Well, yeah, I was just going to comment one thing on the first point, which is like unlike normal Cori, which has Aries in which uh, MPI is much better than anything that uses TCP or something, the GPU nodes actually just have sort of regular InfiniBand. So, uh, so I'm sure that there probably are advantages in terms of the, the protocol, but there's no, in, in terms of the hardware, there's no real difference. You know, it still doesn't have any priority or anything. So, so have you considered uh, implementing, replacing it with some kind of tree algorithm or something? Uh, what? For, the, for the, the force calculation. Uh, so that's, Kind of the point that I was making in the beginning that fifties gain you a lot in terms of speed uh, as compared right. to body simulation. But if you try, the more you try to scale up, the communication yeah. issue is just going to get worse. You still so in that case, like the tree algorithm, I think might gain you if you're on small scale courses. But for large scale courses, you still need to communicate across the courses. I mean, this simulation is accurate at very large scales. So yeah. This is you. You don't you, roll to very small scales. Yeah. Like but even true. That's true. But still, I don't think you have the memory requirements for instance. You don't have the. I don't think you have the communication requirements. Yeah. So yeah. there are schemes. There are hybrid schemes that people have played with, and, and maybe we should, right? Because like this space coma, things like that. Um, it's possible that we have to go in that direction if there's no way to solve these problems. <laughs> or if the, the F of T is just to solve the Poisson problem. Uh, uh, yeah, you can learn before. So <laughs> just do that with a different scheme, like just. Uh, any matrix solver might have better uh, communication no, because the correlations are on scales. Yeah. I, mean, <coughs> I think that's kind of going in that direction. What saying? Going back to going back to your question. So, so another problem is that you know initial conditions are almost homogeneous. So three would kind of block there. The three algorithm. You know, and it would almost block there. Yeah, I, I don't know. Right. Yeah. You could do the almost homogeneous yeah. distribution. You know, you have cluster the situation. Right. <laughs> Let's just say, uh, just say the experience, you know, the, this has been going on for 20, 30 years, okay. right? And the experience is that FFT based algorithms are much, much faster than anything tree based or, or, or you know, yeah, grid based. Well, the, the particle on cell is the, probably the better way to do it. Uh, right. the, the particle on cell method that you're doing yeah. is a yeah. good that, idea. That's for the interpolation. Yeah. 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 That's exactly that. Yeah. There's just lots of ways to solve the problem, but you. Get out of it. Uh, so the Poisson like, problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Poisson problem just trying to solve it with an FFT and solve it other ways. I, th I think the point is that on small scales, other ways are more efficient. But given that you have to take large scale forces into account, like over the whole thing. No, no, he's right. Well, I mean, so, so these are two completely separate questions. Yeah. Right? So yeah. what he's making point is that basically, yeah, particle in cell method is efficient. Yeah. yeah, but there are multiple ways, and that is true. There are uh, multiple okay. ways that you can. You don't need to do it spectral. Yeah. 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 You can use, for example, iterative multi-way methods. I see. And yeah. solve it yeah. again on with, the, with that resolution so far as we can. Yeah. So that's what he's talking. So that's yeah. yeah so that's that's, <coughs> that's true. Yeah. Like, is there like a light curve also into account in the Poisson equation? Uh, no. Okay. Not, not at this yeah. age, but some observers who do that, but not at this age, right? Is, is there a way to compute sort of how much memory or how much memory back like uh, data bandwidth you actually would need to use, say, some number of GPUs? Well, like you could say if you're using 
two nodes of core GPU, you know, you're going to be doing these transpose and reshapes. What kind of bandwidth do you actually need? And does that hardware even exist? I mean, we are already running the, this exact numerical scheme on Cori. Um, and so Whatever happens in our C code is the same thing. We have to do transpose and reshapes of those those arrays across uh, entire arrays of machines, and so we have this exact same memory bandwidth requirements for our current simulations. So, uh, we are able so to th that's not. That's for the CPU. So that's what I was showing the ten thousand cube simulation. That that took uh, five hundred thousand MPI. Okay, but the CPUs are slower too, right? So the communication overhead is different. I'm assuming that exists distributed 3D effective boundaries. Yeah, lots of people want to do that. <laughs> Are the libraries that exist at this point in time? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and including they're using them in their cosmology. No more cosmology. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just wondering, are we trying to recreate a 3D FFT distributed library? Yeah. Well, I don't even know what you're using. Are you, are so you at using this point, one? we are asking. What is the best approach for this? Uh, I mean, you're basically trying to recreate it. In, yeah, so in, that's in, so that's in, that's in terms of yeah. 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 So they, they are trying to relearn the same lessons in, but they're trying to implement those in mesh tensor so that they get yeah. a differential yeah. model. So, like, so, so the code is ten lines, right? So, so right now this is like the thing that the implementation that we have is like super nice. There are different <coughs> point is to get that in that mesh tensor. Code. That's what we're interested in. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so this was the essentially the conclusion. So we are on the last slide, essentially. Uh, but yeah, the whole point of FlowPM uh, is to basically develop end-to-end -end differentiable models and allow hybrid models and where you do not learn like from the initial conditions to be observable with deep learning, but you somehow interface the physics that you actually understand very well with uh, deep learning taking care of the parts that you do not understand. Uh, while maintaining differentiability, because what that gives you is uh, access to a lot of high dimensional inference, simulation based inference approaches. Uh, some of the methods I outlined before, the one that we're exploring in work is essentially reconstructing cosmological fields. Uh, and just uh, the whole exercise is a good approach to developing model patterns of our task. Sorry, just to related to that question actually, but the other way around is like what other communities could benefit from a differential model based on FFTs. Yeah. MRI, <laughs> MRI imaging. Right, yeah. So, I mean, even people that nurse might be. <laughs> Sorry, got it. <laughs> so, very interesting. Do you have any idea? How much more expensive the TensorFlow is, TensorFlow simulation is compared to like a scanner and body that does that, that is not differentiable. Uh, uh, simulation that doesn't track the derivative. You know how much cheaper. It so, is. in terms of memory or in terms um, of uh, we did we did some time. we did some computational time scaling tests, but that was on small 30 d cube simulations. Uh, there we were trying to compare against the other uh, approaches like. So some people have simulations which essentially do a, which essentially learn a GAN or other kind of uh, deep networks to go directly from the initial conditions to the final conditions. And the whole the point was that it is super fast. Uh, so to compare again. I think it's just, it's just asking how much, how much. Yeah, no, the, so to compare again. Really ask to it? Sorry? How much is just the differentiate? The, the short answer is it does not add that much. It's uh, essentially on those 32 cube simulations that we did, it was as a, uh, Slightly faster than the CPU based simulation that we had uh, for the same thing. But I think he's asking what the difference between fast PM or just fast PM with differentiability. Right? On the uh, standard, on standard uh, yeah. Oh, okay. And there we know it's most, most fast. Yeah. yeah. That's because just to calculate the frequency. Yeah. 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 Ye
But the memory, 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 memory is memory high. Memory, memory yeah. requirement is high because we have, you know, back propagation requires to store all the all these snapshots. So it's not a factor of ten. No, no, it's not that much. Okay. Well, uh, if you want to save the whole light cone, then yes. Uh, but for example, for galaxy clustering, you don't need that. Okay. I guess yeah. another question. I'm, I'm quite curious how the derivatives are calculated at the end. So you, so you do the forward simulation. Yes. And then at the end, you ask for the derivatives. Respect to whatever uh, so right now, uh, the derivatives that we are calculating is with respect to the initial conditions, because uh, I can go back to that slide. <clears throat> right, so here, uh, like I was calculating the derivative of the gradient with respect to the initial conditions. Uh, the reason being, uh, if you look at this code, uh, the initial conditions are generated from this power spectrum, and that power spectrum comes from the uh, Boltzmann code, which uh, takes in cosmological parameters and generates a linear power spectrum, which you expect. I guess. I guess my question is, uh, how does it under the hood? How does TensorFlow does the thing? Is it doing like the whole forward simulation and then going backwards, uh, and replaying the whole simulation to calculate the derivative with respect to the initial parameters? Uh, Sort of like this backdrop in, in that, your backdrop. Yeah, it's exactly like a backdrop relation here. Uh, this way. It's backdrop in terms of latent space yeah. rather than parameters. Yeah. So all of the n body simulations, like all of the n body ops here, are being defined as state tensor props. So essentially, just the way you do a backdrop in a regular graph to update weights. Here, instead of updating weights, it's updating the initial conditions. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. just using the default tensor for backpropagation? Yeah, for this. Yeah. That, that, that was the whole point that we did not. So for the previous framework that we developed in Python uh, with uh, Yutang and others, we essentially developed the corresponding gradients for all the forward uh, operations that we need, which is fine, which was fine for like if you're just using the particle mesh simulations, but you want, if you want any interfacing with deep learning, uh, which I try to motivate that we do, uh, you essentially have to be reinventing the wheel again because if you want to say use pixel CNN, you have to code the derivatives of the whole pixel CNN. So yeah. that's why we wanted to like just focus on developing forward models while letting the autocrat take care of the whole gradient part of it. That's the entire motivation of doing it in TensorFlow. Yeah. Another question. Yeah. Uh, what's the minimum compute I would need to fit that 32 cube simulation if I want to like hack in a multi grid solver? Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, I'll, I'll just pull up the GitHub. Okay. Uh, I would say, so, bro. Can I, how much? Uh, wait, you're saying. Do you need a GPU like, run on my laptop? No, I've been running this on my laptop. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, like, uh, even for the. Uh, yeah, I've been running 64 cube, uh, up to 64 cube on my. Like, the whole reconstruction with that framework on my laptop. So, yeah, you don't need to submit jobs yeah. and wait in the line. We have a we have a Google collab, we have a collab notebook on on our GitHub repo. You can run it. It takes five seconds and it generates the everything and runs the forward simulation. Sixty four cube. The collab starting to kick me off actually. It's happened a lot. Very good. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah.